Well, it's a very great pleasure to introduce Alexander Sombazis, uh, who is a frequent visitor here to the AA. Um, he set his architectural practice in 1963, and it has now built into um, an international reputation with projects both within and outside Greece, and with a staff of about 70 people. He, um, he likes doing competitions. I think about 300 of them he has done and won about 90 awards in uh, national and international competitions. Um, I don't know exactly when, but he started the fascination with technology and uh, sustainable design probably in the early uh, 70s, which he uh, still has uh, very strongly. And um, I think now he's one of the uh, foremost proponents of sustainable architectural design uh, internationally. Um, he was awarded the Player Passive and Low Energy Architecture International Award in 1998. Alexander Stombay. Well, good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here again, Simos, and thank you very much for the opportunity. So I'm not a teacher, I'm only an architect, and what I'll be talking to you about is a bit about what's come out of practice. I'll make my presentation in two parts. The first part is thoughts on architecture. They're random thoughts. They could be presented in any sequence, or some others added and others taken out. And the second part, I'll show you a little bit of the work we're doing in the office, or we have done. The first thought is on past and future and learning from tradition. I took this picture a few years ago up in North Greece. As you see, it's a tree growing on a tree. And I want to, what I want to say is that if a little man from Mars was to come down and he saw this, he would think that trees only grow on trees. So I want to stress that I feel it's very important to learn from the past, to know about the past, in order to, to think about the future. What we usually do is look at vernacular architecture from, uh, with appreciation. But I really want to say that it's not enough to just look at it in a romantic way. It's easy to look at it in a romantic way, because it's usually very beautiful, it's small scale. When you go into a city which maybe you don't know, if not in the countryside, the most, <coughs> most, the beaut most beautiful parts are usually the old core of the city. But I, th I think that's not enough, and should, one should be careful not to look at it only in that way. So one can be in touch with nature or with vernacular, but as uh, Lewis Hellman has said, and I really like his word, Sometimes it's good to have a washing machine too. What I think is important is to understand the why of everything, <coughs> much more than just looking at, at vernacular and learning from the past. If you learn the why, if you understand the why, then you can really see the inner beauty of all, the, of, of all that's been happening previously. And to understand really why something's done, why it's like that, and what you can learn from it. Not in, in order not to copy, but to learn to be able to go further on. In the past, they had the big advantage of trial and error, because the uh, sequence of progress, the everything was much slower, one could learn, one could make mistakes, learn from these mistakes, and then go on. And as it's been said, that common sense is intuition, and when there's enough of it, it is genius. So that was an advantage they had at that time, which we don't have any longer, as indeed the limited means. When you have limited means and you just don't have unlimited means, you need brains. You need, the, you need to make the best of those means. And we don't always do that any longer. Another advantage of the past was the issue of scale. Most things were on a much smaller scale, which is not so any longer, and when, when the different problems are on a smaller scale, usually they're much easier to solve. And of course in the past, most of the architecture was uh, a f 
I mean the friend of climate and not the foe of climate. I mean architecture really worked with climate, functioned with climate because it couldn't do otherwise. They just didn't have the resources or the means to do otherwise. And to just by a turn of a switch turn uh, night into day or the Sahara into uh, I mean the Arctic or whatever. And that's what we're doing today. The history of architecture is the history of the world because after all architecture is the personification of human environment, of, of the human being. It's everything that's being built is to serve the purpose that it's uh, serving humankind. So that's why it is very, very true that architecture is the history of the world. Thought number two on the setting of targets and the non-linearity of architectural design. These two pictures were from a building site and what I'd like to suggest is that too often we act like uh, the reinforcing on the left. We start out on a beautiful voyage, let's say, with no defined targets. I don't say that targets must be like that, all very, very, uh, let's say, orthogonal or anything, but there must be targets. It's one of the prime things that we should be starting with. And that there's not one solution in architecture. There's not just one linear way of deciding, and if you take this decision, and then you move on, and then move on, and move on. There's much of that, but there's a lot of retracking and uh, stepping back. And there's not, and that's the beauty of architecture, there isn't one solution. There are many valid solutions, but they have to be a solution, and not just anything in the end. I like uh, comparing architecture with a 3D crossword puzzle. You have to fit everything together, slowly by slowly. And if you don't fit the last, last little piece in place, then the whole thing can really dissolve. And as Gropius also has said, there exists nothing finite in architecture, only continuing evolution. And I think that's beautiful too. It used to be that we used to approach architectural design step by step, scale by scale. We used to, we used to let's say, think of the whole project, think of the whole problem we have, and then go into details, and more and more and more details, then one get to the final product. That's no longer so. Since the computer came in, the computer, apart from being a fantastic tool, has influenced the way of thinking, I think, in sometimes not in a proper way, or in a beneficial way, not proper. Because now, the computer forces you to be exact. You can't be just vague. You can't just sketch, and depending on your experience, and your knowledge, etc., etc., knowing that in there, there is the seeds for the final product. Now it can't be just, let's say, so, so that size or so, it has to be exactly that size, millimeter by millimeter. And I think this has really changed the whole procedure of architectural design. And as I said again, of course, it's a fantastic tool, it cannot be otherwise, but I do not think that this should be the influence in the process. On design constraints, we too often think about design constraints as, uh, as something which is really a problem, something which is going to inhibit our architectural uh, design. And I really think that when we think of design constraints as starting blocks, it's something which gives you the power, the imagination, all the reasoning to be able to be creative and to be really, uh, let's say, creative in architectural design. If you find those stumbling blocks, like, like an athlete who's having a, a race, if you find those, uh, sorry, those blocks just anywhere during the process, then they can really help you stumble and not help you to start. And that's all so that one can get to that beautiful game which is, after all, architecture. On fictitious versus real design constraints. <coughs> 
The bird on the left was somewhere in the Aegean. The little donkey on the right was from the Venice Biennale. This is how we really think about constraints. We, we really feel them that it's a burden and that they do not allow us to be creative. But I would like to say that, thank goodness, there are constraints. And there are constraints everywhere and always, whether on the moon, whether on this earth, where, wherever you're designing. There just cannot be any design without constraints. And I think if you want to, as a teacher, to give students a nightmare, you just ask them to do a design of something somewhere with no constraints at all. There could be absolutely no response. I first went, I had an office down in the Emirates in Dubai for about 20 years. And I first went down to Dubai and I knew I was going for, all I knew was that it was for some development. And I was flabbergasted when I was told, well, it could be anywhere, any side, lands available, no orientation. Well, there was a bit of a brief. It was development. It had to be some shops or some commercial, some offices, some housing. But that's all. I do not think that one can work, one can produce, one can be creative as an architect without constraints. So because that's the case, and I don't think anybody would disagree with that. What do we usually do? Or not maybe usually, but too often do, or do too often. We make up our own fictitious constraints. Because we don't bother, we're not interested enough, we don't care maybe, we're not knowledgeable enough to learn before one's continuously learn. So we make our own fictitious constraints. And how often is it? that an architect or a student or whatever comes in at the end and after having a fantastic speech say, well, this and this and this and this and these were my constraints just to prove that he had to do, let's say, a red uh, pyramid. And all the constraints that he put on the table were just to prove that it was a red pyramid was the only solution. So I do not think we should function like that. One should be much more open-minded, much to prone to really understand what's happening around us and thank goodness there are many many constraints and within some limits and some logic that's the only way to be able to be creative so it's the, the issue is to grasp the problem like this very let's say humble boatman he knew what he had to do he knew what the targets were he knew how to achieve these targets and I think there's really just sheer beauty in his creation he didn't have to make up anything in the meantime. Or like these fishing nets in South India, they just pivot, they, they, they swing on the pivot. There's a counterweight behind. They there's very, very little manpower needed. They dip down into the water and hopefully they come up full of fish. So I mean the, the, the logic, the, the constraints which were there really, and I'm not implying that form follows function. To a certain extent it does, but that's too narrow-minded. I'm talking about the broad, broad specter of constraints. On the hidden dimensions of architecture. Well, we all have two eyes, and thank goodness we do. I think it's a fantastic gift we have. But it's also a problem, because as human beings, and even more so, which interests me at the moment, we learn to think with our eyes. Nearly 90 something percent, 99, 95, 91, it doesn't matter, of what we do and what we learn is just by vision. And I think it's a very, very poor way of learning and of, of designing, just by what it looks like. And I'd like to suggest that there are many hidden dimensions in architecture. And I'll just mention a few. The first one being time, which organizes space and relates buildings to climate and nature. Everything that we build behaves differently uh, according to time. And the wisest thing is time because it discovers everything. It allows you to discover, to learn about everything. And of course the biggest thing is space because it includes everything. So anything a humble wall, let's say a brick wall, a white wall, a whitewash wall, whatever. It's a different object. 
in the morning, it's a different object at noon or in the evening, it's a different object in summer, winter, whatever. It's absolutely related to time. And I think I, we do not think of that enough when we uh, design. A second hidden dimension could be air. We design a space and we think it's empty, that it's, it's just void. But there is nothing on this earth which is void of air. And air follows the laws of physics. It creates, again, like time, a completely different environment. If you have this space and it's completely closed, if you have apertures on this side or that side or down here and up there, back there, across or whatever, and I'm not talking about the energy issues. Of course they're involved too. But just the quality of the space and that it is a different space because of the existence of air. And the beautiful examples from all over the world, the Middle East, the wind towers from Iran, and so many other examples, which have made use of thinking about air. Another hidden dimension, of course, is light. And light, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that architecture cannot exist but with light, that light molds space. And when we are creating space, I really think that one of the most important and beautiful things one can get involved with is molding the space by use of light. And of course, light means daylight, means artificial light, means the relation that's such an important relation between daylight and artificial light, and, day and artificial light being the backup system of daylight. Of course, there are some cases you just do not want daylight. But let's be then, let's behave then or design then that you don't want it and it's your decision. Not that you didn't have it because you didn't think of it. So I really think that light, and again the most beautiful architecture, has depended on light, like the Horta Museum in Brussels, or the Rookery by Wright, or the Otto Wagner's Parkasse in Vienna. So many, many, many beautiful examples. The Notre Dame, the Ronchamp, and that, sorry, on the left there's a picture early in the morning, and see the difference the different quality of space. And on the right is the picture at midday, which is south facing, and a different quality. So it's molding space with light, and really using light, apart from, let's say, saving energy, blah, 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 it's really molding the space and using it. And like the church by Lebiska in Finland, in Helsinki, where there's this just beautiful use of light in different, different, uh, let's say, planes like that, and the introduction and if it's direct or indirect or whatever, etc. Another hidden dimension is sound. If sound, if light molds space, sound really floods space. But again, we don't think of it, I think, enough. We just create space, and then if it's a more complicated, let's say, environment, a theater or whatever, concert hall or something, we depend on the acousticians to put correct what we've made wrong. But again, it's, it's too late. Or even if it isn't too late, we've lost all the beauty and all the importance of designing with sound in mind. And if you want a very, let's say, neutral space, it's a different shape that it has to have. If you want to have a lively space, it's a different shape. It's, it's so, so important, just as important, or maybe not as much, but just as important as, as light and all the other hidden dimensions. I love this saying that where does music go when it plays no longer? It just gives you really the essence of sound and acoustics in, in space. One could even talk about odor or smell, which captivates one in the most intimate of ways. And maybe one of the, some of the most intimate or most sensitive or most the strongest memories one can have of a place is, of, is by way of smell. So what I want to say that both for architects and students, I think it's a good exercise to walk through what we're designing, 
take it one by one, which of course is not the case. Everything that I've been talking about happens simultaneously. And maybe sometimes, if you do more here, you're doing less there, or good here, or bad there. But let's take it one by one and walk through our, our design and sort of tr try it out, check what did we want after all. Did we want a very neutral lighting, a uniform lighting? Well then yes, there's this and this and this one should be thinking about. If you wanted an exciting lighting, there's that and that. And maybe having all the control systems to go from the one scenario to the other. On unlearning with every new invention. Man and architects, for sure, at least that's what I think, love inventions. We love reading the paper or hearing about something new that's been invented, some fantastic material which is going to solve all our problems. And then we really forget what's happened before. We forget that the sun is young every day. And it's a complete renewal every day of the same thing, of which part is inventions. And thank goodness there are inventions. But they are not just the solution to all our problems. We should not think of invention. We should not think that just a new glass low E or whatever you want, which has been invented, that will solve our problems and allow us to be free. That fantastic word of freedom. Because again, the basic principles do not change. There are different ways, but the, there are different ways, as I said previously, of achieving, achieving what we want, but the principles are there, with the new inventions as part. And it's just not, not just like in the, on, the, on, the, on the beach that the sea comes and wipes away everything which existed before. I bring this example. This is a power plant, power, uh, plant by uh, with generation, power generation by oil. And on the left is a PV array. So let's say the day comes, and maybe it's not too far away, that we can really use PV and, and let's assume some things which are not that incredible. Let's, let's say that the production of PV is benign. There's no harm to nature. There's no pollution. Even its uh, recycling is, let's say, pollution-free and all that. What does that mean? Does it mean that we can do the same damn stupidities which we did in the 20th century? We can forget about everything just because we can plonk on PV on the roofs, on the facades, and everything. That's what I want to say. No, I do not think that's a creative way of thinking, let alone all the other things, let alone the practical issues of why do we need to, let's say, use all the PV if we didn't need it in any case at all. But again, I'm not trying to stress the energy part, but the, the, let's say the concept of design on preventing and foreseeing instead of curing. My suggestion is that we do too much of curing and much less of preventing and foreseeing in architecture. These people in Rio, maybe they've read something about the sun and what it can do to their skins, and maybe they did take their own, let's say, precautions before sunbathing. But we don't do that in architecture. We just solve our problems with heavy doses of, of medicine. Like this, let's say, I remember this was in Jaipur. This was a poor chap having his teeth pulled out by a dentist on, very on, the, on, the, on the roadside there. He doesn't seem to be having a nice time. Well, that's what we have in architecture. We just depend on the mechanical engineers. And again, thank goodness that there are mechanical and physicists and all the other engineers to help us. But we depend on them. We rely on them. They take over architectural design. And it's like in preventive medicine that you could take your own uh, steps during your life, whatever that means. I don't want to get into that at the moment. And not rely on heavy surgery. The mechanical role or the, the role of the mechanical engineer of all the engineers is heavy surgery 
when sometimes when it's too late let alone if it's too expensive let alone many many other things but uh, just uh, from the gain from the philosophical way of design and like the example on the left maybe it's a very beautiful example I don't want to comment on it at the moment if it's good or bad architecture but it's just irresponsible because how can that be logical or beautiful and how can this be logical and beautiful which is so much, so much simpler means it's solving problems where that is relying on the services to be able to solve and then I, please do not under, misunderstand me I don't mean that this is how we should be designing I don't mean this is how things should look but just the lessons this is the why of everything I started off with instead of just the results which are on the left and I think this is a very important building. It's a seminal building in its times, but it just is a sort of an iconography of services being a fetish. I mean, they've become so important in the design process that it can become the most important part of the building. On whether to design from the inside out or the outside in, and I'd like to say a little more than just playing with words. What's the inside here and what's the outside? What are these elevations in the Piazza San Marco or the Plaza Real in Barcelona? Is it the outside, is it the facade of the open space or is it the facade of the building? Well, of course, it's both. Like indeed in these arcades, either in Milano or in Brussels, these are, it's both together. And this is how I believe architecture should be. This is the plan of uh, where my office building is. Just a second. So what I want to say here, we usually design in this way. We think of the building as the, let's say, the positive object and the open space around it as just what is left over. I do not think that is enough. I think we should be thinking in this way too, where that is the positive element and that could be the negative left over. Of course, like in the examples I showed previously, it's both together, but too often we think like this. This is an example of a small project, it's a house, this is a greenhouse and I just want to show that one aperture here it has an office behind uh, sorry a, a table a, a drawing table behind and the, there's another aperture behind there so you have cross ventilation you have lighting from this space and that uh, window which is a bedroom borrowing light and ventilation etc from this space so it's a space within the space and this, this inside and outside all happening together. And I find that that moment, that space, that interface between in and out, apart from being so important in architecture, can be really fascinating too. It's where many, many things happen. Is it just from black to white? Are the shades of gray happening in between? Depending on the gain on the function on the climate on your attitude on your whole philosophy of living and thin and this interaction between the inside and the outside <coughs> depends so much on culture Next. on the notion of less is beautiful Next. well Mies had said that or if he didn't say at least he behaved so that less is more, more or less. But in any case, it's a whole philosophy, and I think there's a lot of beauty and a lot of very, very important architecture which came out of this minimalistic approach to design. And then, of course, there was Venturi, who as a reaction to the previous, said, well, less is a bore. Well, after all, I mean, you can't design everything. You can't think of everything. Actual life is more of what you see here than what Mies has designed. And there's truth in that too. And then when the 
whole ecological mov movement took uh, importance, it was small is beautiful, said by Schumacher, stressing the, idea, the idea that you can solve small uh, prob uh, problems and the ecology and the environment and the protection from pollution and sustainability in the end means small. And that's what one should be aiming for. I'd like to just add that less is beautiful. And I think the small differences are the following. S less is different to small. Small, that means it has to be small, or you should be thinking small. I think what's more important is to think less. Not, no, sorry, not think less, but sort of <laughs> try to, to solve what your problem is, or your design, or whatever, the whole philosophy of life, with less. It doesn't mean small. It puts you in the position of being responsible, of knowing and of believing that you should choose what is necessary. You don't need a bulldozer to move a little, let's say, a handful of earth. You need something which is uh, what's really necessary. And uh, what I also want to say is for me it's much, much deeper and much more important apart from all the ecological, apart from all the energy, all the sustainability issues that together with that it is also beautiful. If you can design, if you can think, if you can perform in this way, I do think that there's an inner beauty involved. And it's not a matter of just numbers, it's not a matter of obligation, it's not a matter of responsibility, but there's real beauty in that way. And I like stressing this to architects because the, I believe that the whole issue of ecological sustainability, the ecological design, sustainability, the sustainable design, etc., has been overemphasized only as a duty to mankind, to, I mean, to what we're leaving for our children or our grandchildren, etc., etc. I think it's much deeper like that. And I think it's a much more beautiful way of thinking than just uh, figures or whatever else. As long as you think in the issue of less and that you do really believe that it's beautiful. On skins. One can learn a lot from the world of plants and the world of animals, etc., etc. Again, why? Why is the leaf of this plant there different to the leaves of that plant there? I won't say why, I mean there are many, many reasons, many obvious reasons. But there's beauty there, and there's beauty here, and there's practicality here, and practicality here, and issues of survival, etc., etc. And here too, I mean both these beautiful animals, each one has its appropriate skin. The one on, a, on the left is an oily skin, it can close in, it can open up, it can protect itself from harsh environments, from big, I mean, from very low temperatures, the color and all that. And the animal on the right, it has its appropriate skin. It's a dark skin to be able to survive in a lot of sun. It's a loose skin, and it can go days without water, etc. And these beautiful creatures, I mean, she has a different skin on her belly, different skin on her nose, on her back, etc. Isn't that beautiful? Are buildings as beautiful as that? Do we think of the skin of a building being differentiated dif uh, depending on where it is, on what its function is, etc., etc.? Or, or do we just think of it in a monolithic, let's say, solution? And if you go move up to the skin of the human being, well then, without being a doctor, I'd say it's sheer poetry. How it can self-heal itself, how one perspires, how one loses about a litre and a half of water in normal conditions a day, and so many other things that the skin can do for you. It's different here again, it's different back there, etc. Again, let's think about buildings in a similar way. The multiplicity of applications, that's what I want to stress. And the multiplicity, as I said previously a bit, depends on culture, it depends on environment, it depends on many, many things. But it's not just a straight jacket with no, no concern about all the beauty that can be involved. 
on buildings as living organisms. These pictures were taken in a garden I have, in a weekend house. Before the sun comes out, that's what one sees. And the moment the sun op uh, comes, the flowers just pop open like that. And then's when the bees start doing their daily business. Or sun tracking flowers, they are absolutely living and they really live with the sun. Or these beautiful creatures, and as writers said, we should learn from the snail. It has devised a home that is both exquisite and functional. And this example from the Aegean, these are little mounds of earth, just loose earth on the, on the uh, roof. When the rain comes, the first rains come, little particles of that earth are, t are drawn away and they fill in the gaps, the cracks. I don't say that this is what we should be specifying in modern day architecture, but it's the thinking behind this which I find so fascinating. The simple but beautiful, really philosophical uh, situation, which I don't think we think about in that way any longer. Or a skins which are self-healing. And again, I don't say when it could be whitewashing the super high scra uh, the skyscraper. But there's, there's a lot of involvement there and a lot of beauty of the involvement, the rapport between man and his environment. It's not just there and it's a matter of specifications and if it needs maintenance after 20 years or what, or even equivalent thing up north in Trondheim. I like bringing this example. I think it's a beautiful gimmick. I think it's a very nice uh, gimmick, but I do say, think it is a gimmick. It's from the Institut du Monde Arabe from Nouvelle. And this is the south facing uh, clostra he's done on the building, which reminds you, of, of course, a lot of Arabic uh, design, Arabic way of thinking, but also, I mean, of closing and opening depending on what the needs are. I think it's a very, it's a nice example of a way of thinking. On sculpture and the utilizability of architectural space. I've often been wondering what the difference is between sculpture and architecture. And of course I'm talking about sculpture because I, be I believe that from all the arts, that's all the visual arts, the sculpture is the one which is surely closest to architecture. But the uh, boundary between the one and the other I think is quite difficult sometimes to define. Brancusi has said, that architecture is inhabited sculpture. It is, but I do not think it's enough. Proof, I mean, today's installations where you walk through, you can go through, they are sculpture and not architecture. What are these? This is both either in the Far East or this is in, in, the, in Nepal, I think. This is in Cyprus. What is this? Is it sculpture? Is it architecture? This too? And the next, and this, what is it? So what I'd like to say or suggest is that I believe that architecture is sculpture plus function. The moment you add anything of a functional nature to sculpture, then it becomes architecture. And like that, I think that the, the, uh, the hillsides, which are being terraced like that, that is architecture, and it's not sculpture. Because there's a there is a functional reason which makes it what it is. And furthermore, I think what's important to remember is that architecture is sculpture plus function plus climate. Because sculpture you can take and you can put it nearly anywhere, irrespective of climate, irrespective of place, even to a certain extent irrespective of light because you can have a lighting condition in London or in Brazil or whatever you want for the same piece of sculpture. And maybe that piece of sculpture is just as nice, just as good, just as beautiful. In architecture, it is not the case. As I said earlier, the same wall in Brazil or in New York or in London is a different wall and has a different function and a different, let's say, result. And one's always asked, 
I mean, okay, down the Mediterranean, you can do different things that we can't up here north because you have the sun. And that's just false. All buildings are solar. There is no building on this earth which is not solar. The question is how stupid or how clever, how efficient, how beautiful, etc., etc. Because form and shape are not abstract notions as far as architecture. And that's what I think makes architecture different from sculpture. And the reason is that little thing over there on the right. On the difference between architects and engineers, and there's no prejudice in what I'm going to say now, but there is a difference between them. And again, thank goodness there are differences between architects and engineers. An architect is a generalist, and an engineer is a specialist. And the one is complementary of the other. The architects have to, I mean engineers, know more and more about less and less, and that's how they should be functioned, till they know, I mean, everything about nothing. And the architects act exactly the opposite. They know less and less about more and more, till they know again, oh, it's the other way around, I'm sorry, but the architects know uh, everything about nothing, whilst the engineers know everything about very, very little. So it is like that, and this is a difference. We should remember this and we should make uh, use of this. And I think this is one of the difficulties of, our, in, of architectural design, that we have thousands and thousands of num figures of numbers which are churned out by the, by the computer, by, by, by the internet, by whatever. There's this vast amount of, of information <coughs> How can we assimilate all this information? How can we make use of it? And not just be very, very superficial. And one thing which is so important is communication. Because architecture is all about communicating. And I think one of the most important things for an architect is to be able to convince. Every day you have to convince. You have to convince yourself, you have to convince your colleagues, you're working with, you have to convince your clients, you have to convince the more general public and everything. And to be able to convince, you must be able to receive and you must be able to communicate. And another little joke is that roads, bridges, and piers are the stuff of engineers. And wine, women, and men, and sex are the stuff of architects. I think it's architects have said that, but what I really want to stress is that one is not necessarily better than the other, it's just different. And it's this difference that we should be making use of and benefiting from and learning from. I'll finish this first part of my presentation on a thought that egoism, on, ven on egoism, vanity and humility. Every artist, and I do believe that after all, or to start with even, more important, architecture is an art. Ha every artist has and cannot do without some degree of egoism. A whole career, a whole work, a everyday existence is comparison. What have I done? What have you done? What has some, somebody else done? So that is egoism in there. And we are, we're, we are interested. But does it have to be hostile, always? Can it be friendly? And we do have to lead. Of course, we architects love this. We say we're the conductors, we're the leaders, etc., etc. But to be able to do that, you must really have the sense, the education, the, the humility to be able to behave like that. And of course, in other projects like the piers or the, the bridges or whatever I was talking about earlier, before, Maybe the leader of the team there is the engineer, and an architect is part of the team. When it comes to building, it is the architect who is the leader of the team. But we don't work in this way enough. We don't really lead. We just follow what is uh, put, uh, forced onto us by all the other people. And that, I think, is of utmost importance. And we have to communicate, as I said. One has to work more like this and less like this. I also believe that an architect could be, uh, is like a giraffe. He has to have his feet 
really steadily on the ground, has to learn from what's below, he has to be sturdy, he has to learn, he has to get dirty from mud, and it's very, very important that he has his feet on the ground. He cannot just be up in the air. This should be up in the air, should have vision, should be able to see far enough to learn, continuously learn, and to be able to create. And after all, you should, re should remember between there and there, there's something in there, a little heart, because architecture is all about that. Because there are so many problems to solve and so much beauty in our work that I think it is really one of the most beautiful professions one can be involved with. So I'll say a few work, I'll show you a few of our work, a little of our work. I'll start with how I started back in 68. This was a little house. It's open, it's near the sea. It's I, anything I did from the, let's say, the design point of view at that time, from, the, from all the issues that I've spoken before, was more by intuition. So one can say here that one has cross ventilation, there are double roofs, there's shading, etc., etc. But one can also trace here quite a bit of influence in some of the next work I'm going to show you of the Japanese metabolism. This is an apartment building uh, in a suburb of Athens. And each apartment is on one floor, or these ones on two floors. So they have a front side, a back side, a side side, and again with all the issues of cross shading, etc., etc. This was a competition we got to mention in, in Tokyo back in 67. No, sorry, this is the one in Espoo in, uh, in Helsinki. It's a suburb of Helsinki, and we got to mention there. Again, you can trace the influence from the Japanese metabolism. It's a building or structure. It's really not a building. It's a structure that could grow as indeed the next project, which is a General Cement Company headquarters. That's a bit more recent, a little after the previous one, in 72. That was a competition too. The idea here was there's a module of uh, 14 meter 40 this way, 9 meter 60 this way, and the whole building could grow in time. And indeed it did to a certain extent. So all the main services are underground, and then there are just the branches of the tree which come up like that. So they're all small in nature, and like that there's no center and just then the periphery. It's all very neutral and it can grow. I'm very proud of this building. And the reason I'm very proud is because I've learned something from it. The consumption of this building was 800 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. The last building we've done is 50. So it means one has made a little progress. And again, it's not that I'm really referring to the energy consumption. It's the concept of design. This is a very, very deep plan. I think quite an inhuman plan. But we did. This is what it was requested. And, and I'm not just saying this as an excuse. I'm fully responsible for what we did. It was a, what was called at that time the famous Bureau Landschaft, the German invention of an open space of all the flexibility, etc., at the price of both consumption and environment. Of course, this building today could be done in the same way quite a bit better because of technology better lighting fixtures and things. But again, that's my photovoltaic, let's say, example. It's not enough just to put in better lighting because it's still all artificial. All the climate is artificial, etc. It's not correct. You can see at that time of tinted glass without any shading, although maybe it is on quite a nice environment. But I do not think it's correct. This is the first, and I'll stress the word, solar house I did. Back in 77, it's a very small house on the hillside. In fact, it was for our own use, a weekend house. So all the mistakes I did, I've paid for in the meantime and learned from. And I'd say this was the first uh, solar house because I thought that solar then was something different or something important, especially something different. I started because I was always interested in technology 
And I thought that solar was some extra technology, some new addition, some new invention, and fascination, etc., etc. So, of course, it's not like that, and one learns from it. I think the most important, this is a north-facing uh, little building. It's only about 80 square meters. It's very small. And the whole thing is developed to be protected from the wind, which is from the northwest. It's all developed around this courtyard with this one tree. This is right at the beginning. This tree is about that size there. So I think that the most important decision and the most important feature of the whole architecture here is that one tree. And I think it's much more important than any, let's say, self-congratulating ideas that one had in the design of the building. There were solar collectors here, so it's an active system, which means a much too complicated system for what the end result is. But one learns by making mistakes. And another lesson here was that the whole building is clad with lead. I think. I'm going to joke a bit, I say, I think it's very beautiful, let's say, put it that way. I think it fits in beautifully to the landscape there. But of course, lead in the summer heat starts with a te surface temperature of maybe 80 degrees. And I do not think that's the right way of starting your whole process of U values, etc. That's another mistake. And also, if one doesn't know all the parameters involved, I designed this house, and I think still this is quite a good idea of it being able to see these sliding doors all sliding away. So this whole corner, this interior corner related to the uh, courtyard outside is all inside out, outside in, etc. Except for the snakes. We didn't think of them then. And since they're there, this is you don't often see it that way. Next. This was a competition I did in New Delhi. We got third prize, was Sterling was one of the jurors at that time, and it's the Indira Gandhi Center. This is nearly a kilometer long. But I want to show how we dug out and put parking underneath there. We, create, we created this wall to protect from the north wind. We created these open spaces for museums, for exhibitions, for theaters of different kinds. We had this a sort of a, a reference to Latians over here because there's some very beautiful Latians buildings on the other side of the street. So I want to say that it was uh, quite a bit later, but uh, it's, uh, that's wrong, in fact. That was about in 76. That's a wrong date there. It's a bit later than the other projects, but it's starting to be uh, conscious of environment. This is a mosque I did in Dubai in 82. There's a big building over there, and this is the south. And the main feature of the mosque is this step uh, section. And one introduces light from the south side, but it is shaded by this building over there. Because of the very strict orientation one has to have of the holy wa wa wall towards Mecca, you have this shape within that space. You have this entrance here. You have different levels. You have lighting coming in from above. And you have all the lighting of the main space here, which can fit about 1,000 persons. This is a schematic diagram. There's the big building not shown over here. So you have your first reflection on a light roof, a second reflection on a white ceiling, your third reflection on the holy wall, and then some backup lighting accentuating some parts of the of the holy wall there, the mihrab wall and you can see it here this is the daylighting coming in these are the loudspeakers and you can see this is all sayings from the quran and the, the accentuation I'll just show this for the softness of the space and of how we treated artificial with day and it has been successful. They use it for all times of day, for lessons, like you can see over there, or even just to spend their time because it's a nice, cool environment. This is our offices. What I'd like to stress here, and this is a sketch I showed you earlier, is this semi-public space. So instead of just plonking the buildings, which is so common because of setbacks and all the other regulations in the middle of the space, we developed it in this way. 
with ponds, with open space, by transplanting very beautiful mature olive trees, etc., etc. Again, using daylight, all the apertures are related to the workstations where one's sitting. The integration of art, which I very, very much believe in, with, within architecture, the lighting which comes in, and the whole plan, which is all these, let's say, half levels. So you have a anywhere you are, you can have a perception of the total space, and you can use your legs instead of the lift. The layer, it's very narrow. North is here. It's only about eight meters wide here. So you can see the apertures in relation to the... So we can have cross ventilation. We have side lighting. We have top lighting. We also have ceiling fans, and that's something we use in most of our projects. There's a no very open structure, so there's no pockets of air, apart from the visual effect. Uh, we have night uh, ventilation. We have about 25 air changes per hour. So we're cooling down the whole mass of the building, which makes a difference of about three, three and a half degrees next morning in summer. And this is a bit of what it looks like of this openness. And this is which has uh, a consumption of 50 instead of the 800, which I showed. And the measurements done by the University of Athens are that equivalent air conditioned, and this is air conditioned, both heating and cooling, as a backup is, is mechanical. So the equivalent buildings in Athens are about 280 to 300, compared to the 50, oh my fantastic achievement of 800 of some years ago. This is another office building. It's an east-facing office building. So you have shading of this nature on some floors and shading of this nature. This is 70% shading with a laminated glass louvers, which can, change, can turn uh, by a computer uh, program or manually if you wish so. We introduce night air from here through the space and out at the back. There's a shading. There's an exposed ceiling, no false ceiling. And this is another thing we do wherever we can in projects. And of course, the beautiful ceiling fans. Ceiling fan extend, extends your comfort zone, at least in the conditions of Athens, of about three to three and a half degrees. That, re that really chops off most of your energy for cooling in summer. You do need some more energy, of course, when it's really hot, because it's humid. It's not humid also. Some simulation work was done, detailing of the facade, and the view you have out. And these are some, it's all a false raised floor, as I said. We designed the partitions. You can see the exposed ceiling. And here, it's when we don't have the blinds, because there are interior blinds too, to control light. It's, uh, shading basically is a matter of, of thermal control, but from there on, for, let's say, fixed shading, but movable shading is a matter of control of light too. This is a small house, more recent. And all I want to say is that it's quite simple. You have water coming right up either in a pool or, or a swimming pool or in just shallow pool, water coming right up. It's, it's as, as if you're surrounded by water. And then you have all these issues, I mean, all these devices where you can shade and create a good microenvironment. This is, uh, this is a long love affair. It's the extension and uh, modification or refurbishment of the Museum of Delphi. Delphi is a beautiful site. If you haven't been there, whenever you have the chance, go there. It is a beautiful site. So it was started in 85, and we only finished last year. That's bureaucracy. This is the development of the building, the beginning of last century, then pre-war. And you can see the proximity to the archaeological site. And this is before we uh, entered the project. So one of the things which was requested was sort of to hide 
it's very very cramped and to also hide the building from the uh, from the vision point of view from the side this is the conditions uh, prior to any intervention this is the uh, statue of the charioteer a very well known piece of ancient sculpture this is one of the ceilings in the hall of the Scythians this is another hall you can see uh, the good thing with many of the archaeological museums are that they are daylit but by intuition and not always as you can see here in a proper way this is a building of the original or the second the middle picture previously by Karandinos who was a very uh, well known architect and did some very very good work but one can see the mistakes or the problems that existed apart from the acoustics which was also really terrible this is a reconstruction of the ancient shrine and you can see all the ramps up to the temple, to the theater and to the stadium which is further up and this is which what is influenced our design to an extent. So we made these ramps, we approach the building on a higher level, you come in here which is a logical level because the main exhibition space is there whilst originally it was cramped through little stairs within the building and we did these, the sequence of walls, let's say, of planes, which hide, they respect the old building, and they even show part of the old building, so as to be able to show history, the development through time. Most of our intervention was in the roof, and we did this new ceiling in the Scythians, in the hall of the Scythians, or this new roof, which you can see there, and this was done with a lot of, let's say, research, with many people involved. There was uh, Mike Wilson from University of Northern London, Bartenbach, and many others. And the acoustics also. And instead of directing light onto his bald head over there, they sort of reflecting light that way, so as to really make best use of the lighting effect. And another issue, it's all about what I said molding space with light. So we have this wall, this panel over there, and there's another one on the right, another one on the left. So there's an aperture behind which you can't see. But it plays an important role because you have light in coming in, reflecting on the back side of that, and reflecting onto the wall. And that's the balance between the light intensity on the wall there and the light intensity coming by sequence of reflections onto the object there. This picture is taken by flash and that's the natural lighting of the, of the sculpture. New roof we put on here with exterior blinds. We had to keep the old, let's say, and these are the walls that you can see both in the evening or during night or during day. And the small extension, because there's very little space, we did uh, next. This was a competition we did not get any prize on uh, for. In this is the archives of the government of of, of uh, Japan. The first prize, and, and I think it is quite a nice building to look at. I'll just leave it at that now because it's just recently been finished. It was a, just a, a glass box. And within that glass box, there's all the archives. So, without comment. Uh, what we did, south, you can see, so we turned the building a bit, so it's due south. We created a big wall over there, and a huge trench. And we directed natural light by way of uh, sun tracking mirrors into this trench. And then we had uh, second reflection by other mirrors into the different levels of all the storage of the, archi of the archives which are underground. So contrary to the uh, Grand Bibliothèque, let's say in Paris, which most of the uh, storage is up in the air, and exposed to the sun, and then they put in all the louvres afterwards, this, most of this is underground. There's quite a lot of use of water. And this is all the administration. And this is all semi-underground with a lot of sculpturing and molding of the roof for the libraries. And you can see here in courtyards. And this is this big wall. 
And within this wall, apart from the, the solar tracking mirrors, there's the whole, this wall was uh, uh, all proposed to be with PV, and also within that wall, there's all the communication, the pneumatic system of getting uh, what you want from the basement into the reading area. Next. This is an office building near Athens. It's for the headquarters of the Greek refinery. I'd like to stress these structures here of sort of extending the actual skin of the building more in space to the macro environment and by, you can see the use and protection. It's quite an introvert building because there's quite a bit of pollution in this area and by doing that these are spandrels which are insulated but it's glass, printed glass there, clear glass, etc. This is a viewing tower. This is southeast, so it could be shading that way. This is a schematic of it. I mean, this is the main spine of the building. And then you have buildings, uh, wings which are like that, one there and two, with an interior courtyard. And this space there, which is like the main street of the whole structure, you can see here on different levels, with glass, with light coming in, filtered, etc. This is a building which we've just nearly finished construction at the moment. It was a competition which they didn't give a, second, a first prize, but they gave us the project as a second prize. And again, it's two wings. There's one wing here, another one over there, with an atrium in between. This is in Cyprus, and it's for, for the power company. And you can see this is a thing we've done many times now. Of, of breaking up the main volume of the building into smaller parts, treating the south facade as a double element. Here we are shading glass here with PV. The use of PV in these cases is more demonstration for the time being than really actual uh, making you from the financial point of view. And you can see the configuration of the atrium here for introducing north light and uh, ventilation, etc. South facade, again an insulated glass spandrel, clear glass, etc. Next. Next. This is a competition which was won by an Irish team was for the uh, Archaeological Museum in Cairo. And this is uh, just one quick word about competitions. Seamus mentioned it a bit. I do believe that competitions are extremely important. I think there's hardly any other profession which contributes so much to, to let's say, to, to man, like the architects and all the other members of the team were involved in a competition. In this competition, there were 1,750, if I remember correctly, entries. So, of course, you don't know it exactly from beforehand, but I mean, the chances of winning is, are rather slight. But I still think that they are very, very important. It's a fantastic situation to be in a jury. One feeds like God, because you have everybody at your feet there. You have, and you've taken so much time, so much effort, to think about what you're doing. And there the jury has that at his, at, at his feet. And all he has to do is compare. He doesn't have to go too deep, but he has the fantastic advantage of, and luxury of just comparing. And I think this is beautiful as a, as a way of uh, contributing and functioning. The one drawback of, of competitions is I believe very strongly that architecture is all about dialogue. It, and it's a continuous dialogue. And that's one thing that is missing in a competition. There's no dialogue. You're alone with yourself. You're out at sea with all alone. And only afterwards, when you see what the others have done, which is so much better many times than what you've done, and you learn from that, and you see what the result is, then the sort of the dialogue within yourself, because it's too late, of course, then. But that's when it starts. So I think that's one drawback of competitions. 
But there are many, many advantages and many, a lot of beauty in competitions. And I've said many times that I believe that when you're young, maybe it's the only way to get work, to join the establishment, as they say. But when you're not lo uh, young any longer, it's the only way to keep young. So I really think that it's important to do competition. So this is the access. We flooded the area in front. Everything is underground, and you come into this big space. And it's X, Y sort of composition. X being each theme. There were six different themes. War, I don't know what the other was. Tools, etc., etc. Religion, etc. So these are all courtyards. So you can move through the theme uh, time-wise, or you can step back and go. You can move this way in the Y direction this way in the y direction from theme to theme and you can thread your way through like that time wise next and we call this the traces in the sand because really it's invisible from outside but it would glow at night from the courtyards and of course be the other way around in daytime this is a project which is now under construction it was an international competition it was for a church of 9,000 people, so it's pretty large, in Fatima, which is a very important pilgrim center in Portugal. This is the space. This is the existing basilica, and this space here. From there to here, it's about 550 meters, about 150 meters wide. This space can fit about 450, 500,000 people. So the, 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 the scale was large. This is the chapel of the apparitions, and that's from where they take the, the statue of the Madonna to the church we were building right over there. Next. So this you can see in a nutshell what it's all about. This is, it's a round shape, so it, can, it very much relates to the openness of the space there. And the two huge beams. This is 125 meters across. We span the, with the two beams across the center, so the whole structure is supported from these two beams. The structure over here and over there is a steel construction. It's just a very simple shed roof, a, shed, a sawtooth uh, roof, which you cannot see either from because of the geometry or from inside, because under that shed, uh, that shed, there's a membrane, a translucent membrane, which is hung and which diffuses light. And we have two kinds of light here. We have from the clerestory windows here. We have north light, in, na, light introduced from the north. And on the axis here, which is so important in this case, both because of the mon monumentality of this whole synthesis and the movement, the procession, you have south introduced light on this axis. So you have this variation. And then the whole thing again is on a computer. So you can do really whatever you want. If you want, you can darken the whole hall. You can lighten up only over the altar. You can lighten up uh, around the periphery. So if you can have, say, two or three or five programs, depending on whether this is used as an assembly hall or for, for mass, or even during mass, you can vary the quality of the space. And not only, of course, the lighting. The lighting creates the whole quality of the space. There's a very deep recess here which introduces you into the uh, main space, which is over here. It can be split into two, a smaller when it's not full for 3,000 people. It's over there. There's a wall which disappears into the ground, or 9,000. And of course, it was all a matter of acoustics of fire escapes and all that sort of thing, and the movement within the space. And the basic design, of course, starts by trying to make people come close up to the uh, presbytery next. Also, I've, uh, can you go back one, just a second? I'd like to show these two pools there that are steps. There is a big corridor here, and chapels underground, which have a little light from the backside coming. But these pools are so important. They're shallow, light reflects over the, uh, from the water 
onto the ceiling of that space there and into the ceiling of that corridor there. And these are different lighting uh, exercises done by Bartaba. Next. Of, let's say, uniform lighting, of controlled lighting. Next. And this is some recent pictures of the construction. This was a competition. We got a prize, not the first, but we got a prize in Stavanger. I worked with David Fleming, who's an acoustician here from London, and Max Horden for the services. We built the whole building underground here, so one can bicycle across, move across by foot. We did this inclined tower, which has a viewing tower, a viewing platform over there, and a restaurant. It's held up by cables. But it's also for the two halls which are here, it's the, uh, the exhaust system of, of air of the two halls next. We cut out the ground like that, so everything which is underground is, out, is naturally lit and ventilated. Next. You can see it here in this drawing. The two halls are entirely closed, and this big foyer is very, very related to the see and all the movement which happens there. And you can see the scale of the construction, how we sort of reintroduce the natural profile of the land and the relation with the ships. Here there's the foyer, the main hall, but even there you see we're introducing light from that way there. And this, as I showed you, or as told you, is all the ventilation with a recycling with a uh, of air over there. Next. Next. This is a project which was done for the Olympics. Unfortunately, like indeed in this country, there's a design and build system. We were uh, privileged to do the original, the preliminary design, but it changed quite a bit in the last phase, with which the original design has nothing, no say at all. So we had lighting from the ceiling here with flaps which were north facing. They were emitted and there was suspension of the structure here. And this sort of brings down from the street level there down to the lower level over here. In the Olymp and also another change was that these cuts through the building, we had exterior shading or in exterior control of light or darkening the space. This just ended up by just being uh, reflective glass. Next. This was used for the table tennis and the gymnastics. This is the completely artificial environment. I mean, all this is blocked up, as you see, but it <coughs> could not have been so if you want. This is a project which was more recent, was finished a few years ago. It's an office building just to development in Athens. And we broke up the two buildings with this public space in between. Next. You can see it here, the super shading here, or the superstructure shading the south facade of the second building there. The shading of this southwest and southeast building over there. The more ancillary space behind here with this little, these small holes. Next. And this plane of the different, let's say, transparency by way of shading. And I'm just finished with that quote that the reason we have two ears and one mouth is to hear much and say little. So I'll stop with that and thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Anyone? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alec. Okay, thank you very much, Alec, for this excellent presentation. 
The question is global or local. Hmm? What the question is global or local? Well, global, of course. I think there's, there's such a fascination and such an advantage in so many very, very important things that architecture, and indeed architecture is only part of life, as I said, that our whole way of thinking is global. And I think we cannot behave any way, any longer, in a way that we're small societies, apart from all the other societies in the world. I think that's a beautiful situation. And one can really know what's happening on the other side of the world in an instant. One profits from that, one gives back maybe a little bit to that. I think these are beautiful advantages of the century, the past century and the century will be coming. On the other hand, as I try to stress, climate is different in each part of the world and culture. And I, only, I think the only two resistant points to this globalization, and by that mean, I just mean the bulldozer that just sweeps across everything, irrespective of many, many sensitivities. The only two things that can be a stopping to that, one is climate and the other is culture. It just has to be different from place to place, both the one and the other. So I think that the combination of the existence of the one and the necessity for the other, I think it's the most fascinating time we're living in. And it's much more fascinating and much more open to creativity than other times. And I really think one shouldn't take it either pessimistically or one should ignore the fact. And I think that's a very fascinating uh, challenge to designers. So what is, what, what is the next stage for you then? What's, uh, what's the next project? What is it that you haven't done that you would like to do in the immediate near future? Well, <laughs> I think an architect has the advantage and disadvantages, a d disadvantage of having to work for a client. I think that's a big advantage because what you're doing is so much a social contribution. You don't work for yourself. I mean, many architects can think up beautiful things and many of the important present-day architects started as theoreticians, I mean, just dreaming. And then they proved that they could do much more than that. But real architecture is all about building. And you can't build for yourself. And th by that, I think that architecture is very <coughs> similar to music. You need interpreters. Maybe musician, it used to be that he had to have a client, but most often the king or whatever, the prince. But you don't necessarily have to have a client as a musician. As an architect, you do have to have a client. But what's similar is that you need interpreters. Architecture is not a one-man show. First of all, the actual process of architectural design is not a one-man show. I'm sort of avoiding the question for a moment. But in the office, for me, the most fascinating moments is when you're talking with your colleagues. When you're that dialogue I mentioned. And I really don't care a damn if an idea is my idea, your idea, his idea, or what. It means nothing. It's everybody's idea. And the better you are, the better you can better my idea. And the better I am, the more I can add on to your contribution. And that's what I believe how architecture builds up. But in the end, you need a vast amount of people who interpret what you're doing. And I think uh, ar architecture is a real, has to be a very, very sound marriage between a high quality client, a high quality design team, and I'm stressing the team and not only the architects, everybody involved, and the contractor. If one of those three are inferior, the total, the total result will be inferior. They have to be of the same quality. It doesn't help for the two to be up there and the one to be down there. So that's the beauty and the disadvantage of architecture, that many good ideas end up as in shambles, 
But again, I think it's the responsibility of the architect as far as he can to try and influence and get the thing built. Because no big one can look at beautiful pictures, but that's, only, that's not full architecture. The full responsible architecture is getting that done, maybe a little worse, but getting it done, getting it finished, convincing, fighting every day for all those problems one has. And that's, I mean, another thing which I think is so difficult and fascinating in our work. Take a painter or something. If he wants, first of all, he can do something in a jiffy. No architecture is done in a jiffy. At least in my country, it takes quite a number of years. And maybe elsewhere, it's something similar. So it's not in a jiffy. A painter, if he wants, if he feels like it, he can just destroy what he's done. It's up to him. The one thing which is also different in architecture, I, I like uh, comparing ar architecture to the delivery service of a courier system. You have to deliver a specific object at a specific time to a specific person in a specific place. It's just as simple as that. You, don't, you can't come back to it. You can't think about it in retrospect. You can and you must. But it's there, and it looks back at you in the face. So you have to deliver on time. It's not theory. Architecture is so different from theory because theory can be perfect. It can be, it can be perfect. It can, it can touch perfection. Architecture has all the imperfections. And I think there's a lot of beauty in these uh, imperfections, and the, that's what we have to do. Thank My you next. very much. Thank you for the thoughts and the lessons. <laughs>